Order. Kate Osborne to move the motion. Kate Osborne. Thank you. And I beg to move that this House has considered the recruitment and retention of foster carers. Uh, it's an honour to serve under your chairmanship today, Mr Robertson. I'd like to start by thanking the Backbench Business Committee and the supporting members who made it possible to secure this debate. I'd also like to pass on my thanks to the Fostering Network, Home for Good, and one of my local authorities, South Tyneside, for providing me and my team with meetings and relevant briefings, which were very useful for today. I'd like to put on record my thanks for the work these bodies do in champion, championing and the overlooked and neglected fostering sector. And I'm sure all members here will uh, want to join me in welcoming the fostering network along with some of the foster carers that we have with us today in the public gallery. It's great to see you, see you all here. Mr Chairman, one cannot underestimate the important role fostering plays across child protection and safeguarding. In a climate where over the last 12 years, local authorities have been forced to adapt their operations through cuts to local expenditure, exasperated by the coronavirus pandemic, the demand for foster carers and children needing emergency support has never been more important or in, or in demand. This is why, during my opening remarks to this debate, I would like to focus on why the fostering sector and carers need increased recognition and wraparound support from local authorities and independent fostering agencies. Whilst this debate is centred around the recruitment and retention of foster carers, we also need to look at the broader challenges faced by the sector and where we can share experiences of local authorities and constituents to not only platform the sector, but to raise the profile and actively encourage people to enter into fostering. I give way. Congratulate her um, on securing this debate today. The Welsh Government's initiative, Foster Wales, has created a network of local authority fostering networks across Wales, showing a clear national commitment to the cause. Would the Honourable Member agree that England and Scotland might also benefit from a similar national call to action? I thank the Honourable Member, and yes, I, I would agree, uh, and I've been making references uh, similar to that point as, as I move along. In terms of recruitment, in preparing for this debate and looking at the statistics, two particular figures or facts stood out to me. The number of initial inquiries to foster is at an all-time high. There are 160,635 initial inquiries from prospective fostering households in the year ending the 31st of March 2021. But in contrast, only 10,145, that's a mere 6% of applications were actually received. And the second figure or stat, according to the annual fostering statistics published by Ofsted, the number of foster carers in England has only increased by 4% since 2014, whilst the number of children in foster care has increased by 11%. These statistics show a crisis in recruitment and retention. As members in this debate today, from all sides, with issues of significant shortfalls in the fostering sector, we have to ask the most important question. Why is this shortfall occurring? And what can we do in this place to help alleviate this recruitment and retention crisis? One answer to this question is, I believe, that we need to champion foster carers. However, central to championing must be deeds and not just words. We need to make sure that foster carers are fairly paid and respected as workers. In terms of pay, the Fostering Network's findings in their organisation's annual 2021 State of the Nation foster care report are damning. Over a third of foster carers said that their allowances do not meet the full cost of looking after a child. This is certainly something I can give testimony, personal testimony to in my experience as a foster carer before entering this place. And it's also been said to me today by some of the foster carers that are here. Secondly, 14 local authorities reported that their foster care allowances were below 
the national minimum allowance for at least one age group across England. Of these, two were in England, uh, sorry, two were in London, four were in the South East, and ten were in the rest of England. And whilst I recognise and thank the Children's Minister for writing to 13 local authorities on this specific issue concerning the national minimum allowance, this also has to be weighted alongside this government's political decisions to put the burden of inflation and the cost of living crisis on the backs of ordinary people. I will. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and for making such a, a meaningful speech and also speaking about her own experience as being a foster carer. Um, she may or may not know that um, I used to be a manager in, in fostering and um, for as long as I can remember, there was always an issue to do with the retention and, and uh, retaining of, of foster carers and foster carers not being valued enough. But would she also agree with me that when we've, have such, we've, when we've had such severe cuts to local government funding, this indirectly has an impact on the level of support that social workers can offer foster carers, and then that has an impact on their ability to, to continue fostering and how they look after or can manage the welfare of a child. Thank you. I thank the Honourable Member. And yes, she's absolutely right. You can't keep taking money out of local authorities and expect them to still deliver the same level of services. Uh, and the impact, of course, uh, is unfortunately on the children and young people that are in, uh, in, in the fostering system or, adopt, or, or, or in the, in the ch child services. And the financial press pressures and stresses felt by carers, as highlighted by the Fostering Network's research, is only set to get worse. The Nationwide Association of Fostering Providers believes that the government should urgently make a pay award to foster carers, both within local authorities and IFAs, to preserve and protect this precious resource for children and young people in need. This would be an important signal to foster carers that the government really does value their contribution. In terms of wraparound support, another critical deed which we have to be aware of is the responsibility local authorities and IFAs have in providing vital, often emergency wraparound support for foster carers and their families. On this, I'd like to mention and put on record my thanks to South Tyneside Council one of my local authorities for their progressive outlook in prioritising in this area. First and foremost, we have to recognise each child currently being supported through fostering services has different and complex needs. Needs which must be met from the first moment a child comes under the care of their carer. This is why South Tyneside's model of training carers to degrees whereby they can be matched with the child best suited to the carer's level of training is highly commendable, a model which is in the best interests of all parties and most importantly in the interests of the child or young person. In this it is vital children are kept as close to the local authority as possible. This approach means at crisis point there is no delay in support and any such crisis has a better chance to be mitigated as tailored traumatic and therapeutic support can be accessed quickly. Um, I thank um, my honourable friend for giving way and she's making a really powerful speech on this important issue but talking around the role of local authorities and uh, the point already raised about funding would she also agree with me that the crisis in social, uh, children's social workers and the shortage that we have um, is just exacerbating the problems and will impact on the very uh, commendable uh, operating model she just talked about then? Um, I thank the Honourable Member, and uh, yes, I absolutely agree with you. Um, as has been said, the, 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 the funding that is being taken out means that we can't continue to, um, or we're not continuing, unfortunately, to provide the support that's needed, um, both in terms of social workers um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and all the uh, many people that are involved in children's care. The system South Tyneside Council has in place um, means if breakdown between the child and foster family occurs, it is the local authority who are accountable, thus upholding the fostering standards to improve outcomes. We have to be aware that with such support mechanisms in place, more people will be encouraged to become foster carers. 
However, it must be said, South Tyneside's model that I have illustrated relies on factors where the responsibilities, responsibility lies truly at the feet of government ministers. The cuts to local authorities over the last 12 years, along with the present day record levels of children needing emergency foster care, means my local authority, like most others, must turn to independent fostering agencies to plug the gap. The money local authorities have to spend from government grants, council tax, business rates has fallen by 16% since 2010. This means local authorities have an increasingly limited capacity to respond to these significant inflationary pressures. In respect of IFAs, and whilst I respect the work members in IFAs do in alleviating the pressures felt by local authorities, these agencies have the ability to add another complex, unnecessary layer between the child and the local authority, meaning when crisis hits, unnecessary delays, which are detrimental to all involved, are often hard to avoid. In South Tyneside Council, I can tell you that 50% of the children are placed into IFAs. Underpinning the, the issues, I've mentioned we also need to break down people's popular perceptions of fostering, which undermines the diverse and varying shapes fostering can take. Fostering should not be compared with adoption, although it often is. We need to break through this perception that fostering is a means whereby adoption is the end, because one size does not fit all. We also need to recognise circumstances in the lives of carers can change, and with this, the value in a, in a care of fostering one child needs to be recognised as having the same value as a carer who may foster many children. Finally, we need to appreciate that foster carers can be thrust into a situation more often than not at extreme short notice as their, um, as their presence in the safeguarding process can often be to provide emergency care. I will giving way and she's making a very powerful speech and I think the House is always at its best when members draw on their personal experience and this speech is really showing that the member knows what she's talking about and before I ask my question could I also add my thanks to the Fostering Network who I worked with a lot in the past and have found um, to be incredibly helpful. I wanted to just pick up on BAME fosters and children from BME communities because BBC analysis shows that two-thirds of councils in England have a shortage of BME foster carers yet on the waiting list this 23 percent of children are on the waiting list are actually from BME backgrounds and it's black boys who are left longest on the waiting list and I wonder if the member wanted to comment on that and I hope the minister will pick up on this as well in his remarks. Thank the Honourable Member for her question and, and actually uh, this is something that came up in my meeting uh, with the Head of Children's Services uh, in, 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 my, uh, in my local authority, um, highlighting exactly, uh, as, as the Honourable Lady has just said, that we are desperately short of BAME uh, foster carers. Often children arrive into foster care with nothing apart from the clothes that they are wearing, meaning the responsibility lies firmly with the fostering family to pick up where otherwise the child would have nothing. So what do we need from this debate and the government? I would like ministers to look, or the minister, to look at and take serious considerations from the Mockingbird strategy as adopted by South Tyneside and many others and listen to their best practices and other local authorities, which I hope we will hear more of today from other members. Mockingbird is based on the idea of an extended family. The strategy focuses on a fostering hub where satellite carers work in sync to provide specialist and centralised care to children, along with real-time real support for satellite carers. Mockingbird means intervention can take place without the need to necessarily remove children completely from their support network should an emergency occur. Depending on circumstances, the programme can be adjusted to include birth families, adoptive families and provide support for independent living whilst giving assurance to foster carers and those in care that a secure and close support network is at hand. I also want the Minister today to listen to the recommendations set out by the Fostering Network, who amongst others are calling for a fully funded national fostering strategy, 
a National Fostering Leadership Board and a National Register of Foster Carers. In addition to these recommendations, the Government needs to carry out a comprehensive review of the minimum levels of fostering allowances using, use, using up-to-date evidence to ensure that foster carers are given sufficient payment that covers the full cost of looking after a child. Chair, addressing the issues around the retention of foster carers is not one quick fix. The themes of carers feeling unsupported, making financial loss and not treated as workers are themes which in any workforce would lead to a high turnover rate and chronic difficulties in recruitment. I hope today's debate acts as an opportunity to address members' concerns from their own constituencies and will encourage the Minister to put recommendations in. Thank you, Mr Robertson, and um, thank you to uh, all honourable and my honourable members for their contributions uh, in speaking in the debate today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Shadow Minister and the Minister for his comments and quite rightly acknowledge the important uh, role that foster carers uh, play and I welcome his, um, his intention of working with the fostering uh, network and indeed in looking at the allowances. Um, but to allow foster carers from all backgrounds, um, as, as is necessary, as, as has already been stated, to continue in their role, we have to have the correct support in place. So I'd like to reiterate how much there is a need for a fully funded national fostering strategy. We have one in place around adoption and we need one for fostering. There's also an urgent need to support fostering at a local level with the appropriate funding and the right structures at a regional and national level. We need to determine where different functions should sit depending on where they are most accountable, effective and bring most innovation to children's social care. And there's also a need for a national fostering leadership board. The establishment of a fully funded national leadership board would provide visible leadership it would drive forward the national strategy and provide oversight for the sector to ensure a coordinated, collaborative and strategic approach to support and drive improvements. Fostering services and foster carers have long been under-supported, under-financed and undervalued. Now is the need to address these issues and make a real difference to foster carers, to the many people that support them, but most importantly, to the children and to the young people who are so desperately uh, need and deserve uh, the best.